Welcome, everybody. Um, this is uh, the Conservation Games Captain's Run for the Buffalo's team. And you guys are looking fantastic today. I know you've had a lot of fun while you've been doing the competition so far. But this is really a chance for all of you to sort of get together, you know, have a bit of that camaraderie, see exactly how the team's working, and then also to meet your conservation coach. And today we've got Gavin Ford, who is exceptional. So I'm going to hand over to Gavin to talk to you a little bit about the topics that he has in mind. And then we'll have a bit of a discussion after that. So over to you, Gavin. All right. Thank you, Cyrus. Well, guys, thank you, honestly, for making the effort to, to come online today. I see Heath is trying to push away in his way in here. Yeah, he's, um, he's definitely on. Anyway, so look, essentially, the, uh, the focus is really just to, for me to find out a little bit about what you guys think about conservation. I think um, one of the issues is the elephant population. Yeah. Um, you know, you talk about Wangi National Park, um, Mana to, to a degree, um, uh, Chobe and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, it's, in some areas, it's like a napalm bomb has gone off um, with the massive elephant pressure um, destroying the, the flora and fauna. Uh, what yeah. are your views on, on that? Uh, do we have too many elephants? Um, <laughs> Okay, this is, this is a very emotive issue, and it's a little bit of a social minefield, but what's happened over the years, of course, is the elephant numbers have increased, and that's been a factor of natural population increase and immigration, you know, from pressure outside the park. The problem is that there are too, a lot of elephants, too many, I was going to say, in one restricted area. That's the problem. So... The issue is trying to spread elephants over a much further, much wider area so that they, the frequency of interaction with the same vegetation points is restricted or reduced. And yeah, I was going to ask, sorry, is that why um, they're sort of being pushed from hunting concessions? Is that why they seem to possibly have like big populations in restricted areas or is that just... You know, they, there's, you know the hunting... The hunting areas certainly have an effect to some degree. Um, it depends historically as well which went, what went on in those hunting areas. Because per se, in terms of numbers harvested per population, the numbers are very, very low. But elephants are very smart animals. You know, they, they figure these things out. And uh, so, yeah, there is pressure from, well not pressure, there are animals that move from hunting areas to non-hunting areas, absolutely. But I don't think it's a major component of the immigration <laughs> issue. I think it's human, just human population pressures on the boundary of wild areas that have the biggest effect. And that's right through Africa, so, uh, certainly yeah. Savannah, Africa anyway. In terms of the Ellies, I mean, I know coming from originally down in the Southeast Lowfold, Connor is your area, I mean, that's had many problems with elephant populations and whatever and not always having the ability to move with what they wanted to be i think it was the trans kalahari park was that was yeah. what it was called where they wanted to open the borders yeah. um so what's the solution in that case i mean i know as a youngster growing up there i know they used to do elephant culls i mean that is not sure. the answer or where we want to go but is it is it something that still has to be looked at conservation wise if if they want to help control and keep the peace between wildlife and the humans, which unfortunately are not going to go anywhere. Human wildlife conflict. It's mm. as old as agriculture. You know what? In today's world, there's no solution to that. It's, it's so full of um, emotive minefields that, if, you know, whatever you say, you're going to be damned whether you're right or whether you're wrong. So it's not something that's going to be solved that easily. The, the direction that people have taken is to try and protect the people side of it and reduce the effect of wildlife as opposed to damaging the wildlife or removing the wildlife. So rather put preventative measures in to uh, reduce the effect of animals. So protecting crops, wildlife stock and all that sort of thing, you know, making more and more effective barriers that's the angle that people are taking, and that's far more acceptable in today's world. So, just is there is there no uh, is there no possibility that you that 
one could link up. Um, I know that the human population that are on the edge of the parks are educated into the fact that they're getting jobs, tourists arrive, they're able to, to work uh, in the park, uh, and, and so tourists bring in foreign income. But is there no way that you could link that with the hunting? Because people, the hunting, the hunting argument has always been that if we do cull, at least we pay for it. That money then goes into conservation and into conservation, um, uh, you know, making sure that uh, game reserves still continue to exist. So isn't there a balance between the hunting group who need to pay if, they have, if, they, if they're going to hunt, they should be made to pay and extortionately so in order to uh, raise money for uh, a conservation effort that is really valuable. It, it doesn't seem as though just dealing with the poor people is going to solve the problem. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nick, it's, it's not as easy as that, unfortunately. Um, that's a great, it's, and, you know, in theory, that's what, that's, what, that's what should happen. But a lot of the hunting revenues um, go to government and they also go obviously to the operator. And yeah. unfortunately, these sort of things, the, the funds generated by these wild area concessions, and I'll use that a broad term, go into the central government uh, pot. Yeah. But Gavin, anyway. do you think that the onus then should be on, on society and people at large like, like ourselves who have to put pressure on, on government to, to do more and then also to, to try and find ways to, in some ways, not necessarily circumnavigate what government is doing, but rather feed directly into the conservation efforts themselves? You know, it's, it should be a national issue. And I will use the rhino poaching and the pangolin issue as an example. Here we have a prime example of a national heritage, national heritage. So why, do, do, why does this not affect government like it should? You see, it's a matter of priorities. And I don't really want to get too deep into this, but it's a matter of prioritization. And, you know, when you've got hungry people or homeless people saving a bunch of animals where everybody else is trying to get involved and they look at how many NGOs there are involved in conservation issues. Government's taken the easy way out there and they keep an eye on the NGOs and let them get on with it and they commit minimal resources to those NGOs uh, to the, the issue in the field through their departments. And, and I guess this feeds yeah. back to the point you were making earlier, because in essence, you know, conservation doesn't just happen on the fringes, as Nick mentioned, you know, right at yeah. the national parks. This is something that happens uh, right close to your home. So that you, you mentioned having bird life quite close to your house, and yeah. that is affected by construction, by development, and by that sort of thing. So we all have to understand the... Um, our own effects on the wildlife and, 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 and the areas that we, we inhabit as well. Mm. You know, um, one of the questions that I often get, well, gets put to me is, you know, um, these safari camps that we use and they are minimal impact. Okay, well, that's great. Minimal impact would mean one of us taking a backpack and camping under a tree. All right, that's minimal impact. When you build a camp, you take your team and then you put up a bunch of tents and you set up a camp for nine months of the year, you are making an impact. You put in 15 roads, you know what? A kilometer of road is over a hectare of land. That's cleared. So wherever we go as humans, in Western society, humans, we make an impact. It's just all it is is a matter of mitigating it with um, putting in place laws and procedures to, mit to reduce that impact. Impact is something we do. It's just a human thing. You know, we're predators at heart. So whatever we do, we're going to damage a woodland or we're going to scare the animals away from a certain area. You can't get away from it. To think otherwise is being naive. So when we have a sexy lodge built in the middle of nowhere, some pristine concession, the impact is massive 
massive. But, you know, you have the lodge there and it reduces, uh, well, you're making use of the land, first of all, which is financially viable. So there's a return on land. You know, there's no such thing as, um, as Eden. Everything has to have a return. That's the way we are. And so a safari camp in the middle of the Kalahari, for instance, has to have a return to let it exist where it is. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just a root fundamental thing about safari life and going anywhere. Uh, do you think there's, there's any value in utilizing, um, you know, really famous people as spokesmen? So I'm talking, for example, in the China or the Vietnam area where they value rhino horn, instead of trying to protect our rhinos here, isn't there perhaps an argument for going there and getting the most famous Chinese basketball player or Vietnamese, whatever he is, to stand up and say, guys, you must understand this does not help uh, in, in the areas you believe it does and stop buying it. Try to get, try to get spokesmen in the areas where people are buying uh, the rhino horn, for example, utilizing rhino. It used to be ivory, uh, pangolins now. It, you know, there's yeah. always a human bent to, to the reason why they're looking for these sort of things. And surely that side of the education needs to be done as well. So uh, not just from our side protecting our wildlife, but also them who are buying the, 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 the parts, the body parts that is causing all this upset. Yeah, Nick, it's... You know, China's population is uh, nearly 2 billion people. Oh. Mm. I know. That's, uh, that's and, that's with it, and, that's and that's with the birth control for the last 20 odd years as well. Yeah. And yeah. got many more boys than girls. So a lot yeah. of fun in China, so apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that, that Nick's point is, is, is valid here, although, and, and I think this is the other thing, in the sense that I think sometimes we do wonder about the, um, the effect that celebrities can have in trying to curb the way people do things. I'm not sure if it has as much an effect as government there saying, perhaps we need to change things around. Um, Luke who was actually talking about Yao Ming, who's the most famous basketball player in yeah. China, and he's an ambassador for, for Wild Aid. Yes. So, you know, there is an impact that these guys give, but with anything, and this is, I guess, how crime works, you know, if there isn't a market for something, there's no need for something to, to happen on the other end. So yeah. perhaps that is what we need to do is, is to, to try and, you know, stem this at, at the root. Um, and, and I guess, you know, if there's one thing that's come out of the, the coronavirus pandemic is that the Chinese government has started to, to proactively start looking at getting rid of the wet markets and, and the wildlife markets and see how, what sort of impact that has. But um, as we know, the rules are not made for everybody. So yeah. it's, it's not as if everybody buys into it. I think China would have a chance, you know, if the government, became, because it's a completely controlled society. It's a completely controlled society. If government would stand up and say, this is the law, you know what? They would sort it out in a week. They, that's the control they have on their populations. Um, there's very few places you go in China where the government finger doesn't rest. And so if, you, if the Chinese government were to come on board they would resolve a lot of our issues very, very exactly. easily. But, you know, it's a, it's a human thing. Although they've officially issued uh, a, a, some form of document that says you're not allowed to trade in rhino horn and all that, it's not going to stop the middle guy. Hmm. And then, of course, you've got to get hold of Cambodia, Vietnam, probably Japan in the mix as well, and a lot of those Far East countries to get them on board, because you close one market, somebody else is going to open up a market. Um, are you, 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 you're obviously very aware of, of Malalangwe Game Reserve and, and, yeah. and their whole model around, around um, you know, conservation and anti-poaching and, and preserving their thing. The, the human, the human um, uh, wildlife conflict is obviously very much at the forefront of, of a lot of these parks and nature reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it be from a poaching perspective or, or encroachment of development or livestock and that, 
uh, you know, from what I've seen, um, you know, like Malalangwe has had very good success by the local communities on the periphery of that park benefiting, yeah. directly benefiting from that nature reserve. And, and I think maybe that's a model that we can all try and promote because, you know, at the end of the day, if a poacher comes in and we see it with the Matopas National Park, the guys who poach, they are guided in by people on the periphery who know the lay of the land, they know where the, the anti-poaching units are, how they operate, um, you know, may even have uh, um, you know, direct contact with the anti-poaching units themselves. Um, so, so these things are the important thing is, is trying to get, uh, you, you're aware of the campfire project, uh, which, which was put in place around hunting conservancies, and that was also very successful and obviously fell away um, you know, in the latter years. And I think that maybe that's something we could look and focus on. I don't know what your opinion is on it, is, is on the local communities and on the periphery of these parks directly benefiting and maybe those things being built into, uh, into the costs, you know, into whether it's licensing, uh, parks entrance fees, fees that uh, tourists pay, and those go directly to those communities because ultimately they will be the ones that will mm. will create a buffer and protect these zones and 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 that because they directly benefit from it. Um, Heath, yeah, absolutely. You know, it took it took all the colonial governments a long time to figure out the communities on the boundary of these parks areas who take the brunt of any uh, human wildlife conflict. Okay, they have to benefit from having the park there and the animals. There, there's no way around that. And uh, the very first fellow to put that in place was Norman Carr uh, in South Luangwa. And way back, uh, I think it was 54, 53, 54, somewhere around there. And he made an agreement with Chief Nsefu, uh, the Nsefu section. And uh, that, that agreement is still in place two generations later. And the Nsefu sector in the Luangwa um, is under, is a, operated as a private concession and um, it works tremendously. Absolutely no problem at all. Now, you're, the one that you mentioned down the bottom there with, where Clive Stocker was involved, um, Clive has that relationship, a lifelong relationship with the community in that area. And that, uh, example of campfire is a model. Now elsewhere what's happened is that the politicians have got involved and diluted the local population with immigrants because of the voting side of it and so the, uh, the relationship that the people have with the land essentially has been diluted by foreigners coming into that area. That's what's happened elsewhere. And of course, you've had the other human factors where money's gone missing from the, the councils, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But to come back to your original point, communities have to be involved in that. One of the challenges now with the lockdown is that minor pools, the National Parks Rangers are now shooting on the floodplain to feed their yeah. pot because there's been a loss of revenue from, from fees coming in from tourists. So, you know, that... Is for me, conservation faces two significant challenges. One is corruption and all the socio-economic benefits that come from corruption and mismanagement. Um, the second one, unfortunately, thanks to the likes of, this is just my opinion again, thanks to Lion King and these Disney movies, we've personified characters. You know, we've got Pumba and Timon and Scar and, and, and all these dudes from the Lion King, which made their way into a whole generation of the European tourism market. Um, and this misconception that Pumba and, and Timon and the Lion Pride all live under a Pride Rock and it's happy dory and no one interferes. But the reality is as soon as you classify that this is a national park, the day you decide that, the day you then commit to a management of that resource, the idea of trying to say to your market that we value as, as tourism operators, hey guys, We've got a high concentration of elephant in Wangi in the Chobe, the Greater Chobe area. We've got this Kaza framework for, for management of these areas. Um, we've got to go in there and manage this, this elephant population. There's an education bias or a lack of education and understanding that there's two, two creatures in the world that can irreversibly damage the ecosystem. One is man and the next one is an elephant. So 
you, people don't understand that when your elephant putting pressure on that floodplain you spoke about, Gavin, on the Chobe, your bushbuck, your riverine, your riparian species, that all, you know, your pals, fishing owls, everything that relies on that woodland vegetation has now been prejudiced by an elephant population. Those water holes that we now refer to in Wangi as the center of Wangi, they were never there originally. Those populations of elephant used to migrate through from the, the Zambezi, the lower Zambezi, through into Botswana and the Delta. And as the Delta's flood cycles changed, these huge herds of elef elephants moved around. Now we've gone and said, no, no, you elephants can only live in Wangi. And those elephants now don't learn about these long-standing um, migratory routes between water and the Delta and Caprivi and the Zambezi. I think the issues in any of the, any country is, is going to be getting the government on side because, you know, the way governments work, if your government is on side, then you, it's facilitating whatever measures you're putting in place. And um, I just want to mention just one example, which is very distant from Mana Pools. The fishing industry based out of the Cape, you know, the long lining, I don't know if you guys know what long lining is. Okay, they, the trawlers go out and they have long fishing lines with hooks every three feet or every meter along this line that runs for a kilometer or two along the place uh, into the sea. And what was happening, each hook is obviously baited with a piece of fish and the trawlers go out and they're letting out these lines over the side on a wheel, in fact. And what was happening is that seabirds were diving in and grabbing these bits of fish before the hook went too deep under the water. And as a result, we were losing hundreds and hundreds of albatrosses. So an albatross lives about 30, 35 years. Now, the number of losses, the, the frequency of loss of these birds was having a huge effect on the populations of these birds. Now, who would have thought it? There's a fishing trawler out there catching pilchards or whatever it is. And yet these damn long lines were taking such a toll. So a bunch of people got together, in fact, through Cape Town University, and they went to the fishing industry and they said, hey, this is a problem. You're killing off all our albatrosses. And uh, the fishing industry said, ah, oh, please. And they went to local government and got their support and got hold, got the ear of the fishing chairman and said, this is an issue, but this is a solution. And as soon as they took that approach, they said, this is the solution. And government was behind it. Bingo. You know what? That problem has almost resolved itself. And these, these uh, protective measures were put in place. The guys can still long line, but they're no longer killing off birds. So as soon as you get government involved on that scale, things happen. And that's where we've got to go with any form of cons real conservation. Yeah, listening to those last two, uh, you know, speakers, that's fantastic, Kevin. And it seems that um, that uh, you know, our, our country in South Africa, we've got first world problems, which are conservation problems, and then we've got third world problems, which are human problems. And uh, animals don't have a vote; people have a vote. So whenever there's a whenever there's a tendency of of, of a, some policy, the policy will be will be guided by the number of people who will vote for you by taking that policy. And uh, it seems, you know, it seems to be so simple to be able to go to the government and say, can't we ring fence conservation money and make sure that, that none of this goes to the head office, that it goes yeah. to the areas that, that generate the funds. Yeah. It's not as though it's enormous amount of funds, but I'm sure it'll be enough uh, to allow those places to continue to be profitable and successful. But yeah. that is a first world decision taken by a South African government, and they're dealing with third world, and at the moment, obviously, far bigger issues with this COVID crisis. So yeah. it's been very interesting listening to the way you've described it, and uh, it would seem that would be, you know, the best way to go. You have to get a heavy hammer involved. Otherwise, yeah. your efforts are going to be frustrating, frustrated. Rather. No, I absolutely love it. It's been a fantastic, fantastic conversation with you, Gavin. Um, before we all finish off for today, I want to do something a little special. If you can all just sort of unmute yourselves for, uh, I think, another two minutes or so. Um, 
much like how people have been looking after their health services everywhere and giving them a round of applause and what have you, we want to do something a little similar to that. So we're going to have a sort of 15 seconds worth of applause for all of the people who are on the anti-poaching front lines and people who are working on the conservation front lines to try and do something about the problems that we're facing today. So let's just give them a little bit of a clap. And thank you so much, Gavin. It's been, it's been an ed education. So we've really enjoyed today. Yeah, thank you all for being on the call. And um, we're going we're gonna to leave it at that today. But uh, thank you so much and enjoy the conservation games. Our wildlife needs help. Tourism to Africa is at an all-time low. You can assist by liking and sharing the conservation games. You can contribute financially by hitting the donate button on the Zambezia.com website. Let's get together and back up the Frontline Conservation Team.